Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started now. Can you all hear me okay? Hi there. So, good evening, good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. It's evening time here in Boston. Thank you for joining today's installment of National Geographic Learning's webinar series. My name is Emily, and I'm a member of the product marketing team at National Geographic Learning. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to go over a few brief housekeeping notes. So as always, we do recommend attending today's session through a hardwired internet connection. We know it's not always possible, but it does prevent some of the connectivity issues that attendees sometimes experience. If for any reason, though, that you are disconnected, please do not worry. We'll be sending along a link to the recording of today's session, as well as a certificate of attendance and some sample materials for you as well. Um, also, just as a side note, when we play videos today, we will pause them briefly at the beginning so they can buffer for a second. So please just bear with us while we do this. Thank you. And now on to the main event. I'm pleased to introduce Louis Lansford. Louis got his first taste of teaching English in Barcelona in the late 1980s. The experience inspired him to get a master's in TESOL, after which he taught at a university language center in Arizona and then a manufacturing company in Japan. In 1995, he took an editorial job with a major publisher in Hong Kong, developing materials for Asia, and in 1997, he became a freelance editor, project manager, and writer in the UK. He has worked on books, videos, tests, audio materials, worksheets, apps, and online materials for English learners of all ages across the world. His most recent projects are National Geographic Learning's keynote and perspectives, both featuring TED Talks. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Lewis. Well, Lewis, I I think you just need to connect your audio there. There you are. Um, sorry about that. OK, apologies. I was on mute. So thank you, Emily, for the introduction. Um, and I wanted to welcome everyone. We've got over 100 people in uh, the webinar now with maybe 16 countries represented, lots of time zones. So. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you for making the time. I'd like to uh, start off the, the, w with a question for you. Uh, the, the title of the talk is Tips for Teaching Real English. And when we're talking about real English, some people feel that American English is real English or British English is real English uh, or some other variety. So the question of English variety will be uh, important to the webinar. So I'd like to just know what what variety do you yourselves in your classroom teach? Uh, and there's a, a quiz box here. You can actually tick on the poll uh, whether you teach British English, American English, or some other kind of English. Okay, so a little over 70% uh, of people are affiliated with teaching British English, uh, about 22% American, and then something else are about 5%. Uh, and if you teach something else, I'd be curious to know what that is. You could type that into the chat box. Okay. Okay, so we've got some mix there. I'd like to kick off with a story that brings up a lot of the themes, in fact, all of the themes that we'll be talking about in the next 45 minutes. This is a war story. This map shows the area uh, around the Imjin River in South Korea in April of 1951. So this is quite a long time ago. And in April of 1951, a British soldier named Brigadier Tom Brody was there with his men, uh, a group of men called the Gloucester Regiment. And they were defending a bridge across the Imjin River as the Chinese army was marching south to try to capture the city of Seoul. 
Tom Brody's commanding officer was an American guy called uh, uh, Sewell, Brigadier Sewell, uh, sorry, General Robert H. Sewell. So it's important to note that we have a British soldier and an American soldier working together. So Sewell was fully aware of the situation. The Chinese army was coming south, so he got on the radio to Brody because he wanted to make sure that everything was going okay and that Brody was prepared for the battle that was coming up. So Brody, when asked to describe the situation, he said these words. Things are a bit sticky, sir. We're having a bit of rough and tumble, but we're holding the line. So Sewell thought, ah, a bit sticky, a bit of rough and tumble. That doesn't sound too serious. We're holding the line. Everything's okay. So Sewell made the decision not to send any additional troops. Now, as it happened, Brody's men were outnumbered by the Chinese army by a ratio of eight to one. So for every one of Brody's soldiers, there were eight Chinese soldiers. And what happened over the next three days was some of the worst fighting in the, in the Korean War. 500 of Brody's men were captured, 59 were killed or went missing, and only 39 escaped. The only good outcome was that the city of Seoul was saved. So they successfully completed their mission, but at great cost. I can see some people uh, making some notes there about British understatement, and that's exactly it. After this all happened, a British general was sort of talking about what went on. This was some, some years later. Why did this happen? Why, why did this terrible disaster happen when these two guys are both English speakers? They spoke together. Surely they should have understood one another. What this brigadier, this general who was talking about it later said was that an American soldier in Brody's position would not have used those words. He wouldn't have said, it's a bit sticky. He would have said something more like, all hell is breaking loose here, sir. We need help now. And this general who was talking about it said that the two nations spoke military language in a slightly different way. So what happened there was a, a severe we could say cultural breakdown around language. As, as someone uh, noted in the chat box, we could say that there's a tendency for British people to understate things. And we could also say maybe there's a tendency for American people to overstate things. And so when you have this, this communication, things can break down. So that story sort of encompasses the the four topics that I'd like to talk today about. The first one is this question of real English. I've, I've um, mentioned that we're talking about tips for teaching real English today. So what is real English? Was Brody's British English real English? Or was uh, Sewell's American English real English? Or are we talking about something else when we're talking about real English? I'd also like to talk today about the question of accent. Brody had a British accent. Sewell had an American accent. The people who are teaching American English hope that their learners will develop an American accent. We'll talk more about that. The question of culture was at the heart of this misunderstanding uh, that these two soldiers had. And as I mentioned, this, this idea that British people as a cultural trait maybe tend to understate things and maybe American people as a cultural trait tend to overstate things or to be extremely direct. We'll unpack that a little bit. Then the final section of the talk is about audience. Uh, and by that I mean what listeners do when they listen to someone else talk. So in the case of Sewell and um, Brody. Brody was the speaker addressing an audience of one person. Did he consider his audience carefully enough when he spoke? Did he really think about how Sewell might interpret his language? And as, a, as an audience member, did General Robert H. Sewell think critically enough about the speaker he was listening to? Did he read between the lines? So that's it. That's that's uh, those are the, there'll be four sections of the talk today, and let's jump right in with real English.
So here's a question, uh, and you can just type your answers in the chat box. I think everybody has an idea of what real English is. Uh, so what is real English? Let's, let's have some answers in the chat box. Uh, when I say you want to teach your learners real English, what are we talking about there? Okay, British English, authentic English, spoken English, native speaker English, English used in everyday life, up-to-date English, English that's spoken in any given context, genuine English, vernacular English. I, I guess you can all see the, the chat box the same as I can. So all of those, of course, are examples of real English. Anyone who speaks British English is, of course, speaking real English. Um, Spoken English is real English. All of those answers I would consider correct and absolutely right. I'd like to look at some st statistics about kind of all of the English that's being described there. Uh, a little research. There are 2.75 billion people in the world who speak English. Uh, out of a total world population of 7.5 billion. So what that means is that about a third of the world's population speaks English. Now of those 2.3 billion, an estimated 375 to 450 million people are L1 English users. So that means people from the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, some people who speak English as an L1 in India, South Africa, Kenya. About 16% of the people in the world who speak English are L1 users, native speakers. That means that 84% are L2 speakers, people like probably most of the people attending this webinar. So that's just a fact that 84% of people in the world who speak English are second language speakers of English. A second bit of data or information, this comes from uh, David Gradall who wrote a book called English Next and his research led to the figure that 74% of the interactions that happen in English on any given day do not include an L1 user of English. There's no native speaker there. So about three quarters of the English that's exchanged on any given day does not feature a native speaker of English. So when we're talking about real English, we're talking about all of those things that everyone typed in the chat box, English as it's spoken by native speakers, English as it's spoken on the street, English as it arises in various uh, authentic uh, contexts. What we notice is that second language use of English is by far the greatest use of English. And I will we'll talk more about if that if that constitutes uh, a, a def part of the definition of real English, what are the implications of that? Okay, so just to sum up real English, it's 16% first language, 84% second language as it's spoken in the world. And 74% of exchanges that happen in English every day are between L2 users of English. And that's just data, that's, that's a description. So what does that mean about accent? I'd like to run another poll for you. And the question is, what accent do you expect your learners to speak with? And this is a poll that Emily can slide over uh, onto the screen and you can select an answer to. The choice is here, British, American, or something else. So what accent are we expecting our learners to speak with? And those of you who are responding uh, with something else, I'd be curious what, uh, what accent, what you mean by that.
Okay, so we're getting, it's uh, not quite thirds and thirds, but uh, uh, it's a close tie between British English and people are saying uh, uh, something with an L, L, L1 accent, something affected by the first language or some mixture of the two. Okay, if we could move the poll away. I'd like to just run a video uh, that shows three English speakers giving TED Talks. Uh, and all I'd like you to do is just think about the accent that you hear these people speak with. When the video starts, as Emily said, we may have a little pause at the beginning uh, to let the video get started, and this may help it run more smoothly. So uh, be patient if the video doesn't start immediately. Recently, I flew over a crowd of thousands of people in Brazil playing music by George Frederick Handel. Um, I also drove along the streets of Amsterdam, again playing music by this same composer. Um, and Bia was just 11 years old when she started a campaign using one of our tools to save her model public school from demolition. Her school actually ranks amongst the best public schools in the country. Disability in our age should not prevent anyone from living meaningful lives. My hope and desire is that the tools and processes we develop in our research group can be used to bring highly functional prosthesis to those who need them. Okay, cool. So one thing we could say, uh, first of all, none of those three people to my ear spoke with a British accent or an American accent. There may be a little flavor of something, but all, all, all three of those people were clearly L2 users of English with that accent. So one thing we could say, one way to look at this would be to say they missed the target. Because if they, if they were trying to speak with a British accent or they were trying to speak with an American accent, they failed. They didn't do it. But hang on, what, what was their target? What were these people actually trying to do? I think we could say, were they trying to speak like a native or were they just trying to speak intelligibly to, to get their message across, to share their idea with the TED audience? If we look at it that way, then we can say they didn't miss the target, they completely hit the target. So, in language learning, there often is this assumption that the goal is to speak English like a native speaker. That's been my experience as a student uh, of languages. And as teachers, we, we, it just seems obvious. It seems very natural to hold up the native speaker as a model. But I think we have to ask ourselves if that's realistic. I mean, how, how many people ever actually achieve a, a native-like accent in a, in a second language? This view is sometimes called the deficit model of language learning, where we, we sort of view uh, L2 users as, as failed natives. We define them as, as people who haven't quite got there and people who haven't hit the mark. But I think there's a different way of looking at it. We could, we could set a different target and say, what if the target isn't to speak like a native, but it's to be intelligible? What if your accent isn't the enemy, but is maybe actually a, an important part of your personal identity? Uh, and in fact, research shows that in some cases, a, a person's accent in, a, in an L2, a, a, an L2 speaker of English, may be easier to understand because of certain features of their accent. It may be because they slow down or certain features of the accent just make them easier to understand than maybe even a, a native speaker, an L1 user who's speaking very quickly. So as, as teachers, I would suggest that uh, maybe what we need to do is focus on what's really working and what's effective in a learner's accent. Uh, and what makes them easier to understand and maybe focus less on trying to copy a native speaker accent perfectly. 
so what we saw in that TED talk really isn't a, a load of accents. What we saw was some successful communication. So those people hit the bullseye. They had something to say. They had a big idea to communicate. And in all cases, despite the fact that their accent is not like a native, their communication was clear and powerful because their accent was intelligible. I'd like to show another video. Uh, and this is one that we've used in one of our courses. It's a, a video by a guy called Safwat Salim. And it's called, it's a TED talk. It's why I keep speaking up even when people mock my accent. So in this, uh, the, the, the whole talk is uh, maybe nine minutes long. And so I suggest that you go to TED.com and find the talk and watch the whole thing if possible. Uh, if you find that this video doesn't play with sound for you, or the video doesn't play properly here on the webinar, you can go to the TED website and watch the whole thing and catch up that way. But in, in his talk, he, he explains that he had difficulty speaking as a child. He had a stutter. And he felt that his own voice didn't sound normal. Uh, and it took him a long time just to accept the sound of his own voice. Then in the the clip that I'm about to show you, he talks about some work that he did uh, doing character voices on the internet. Uh, and it's interesting to notice at the bottom of the picture, there's a, he included a little meter that goes from red, yellow, and green that shows his level of confidence as people on the internet comment about the way he spoke. So Emily, if you could uh, run this talk, then we'll hope that everyone can, can see and listen to it. A few years ago, I made this educational video about the history of video games. And for that one, I got to do the voice of Space Invader. Hi. A dream come true, really. And, <laughs> and when that video was posted online, I just, I just sat there on the computer, hitting refresh, excited to see the response. Um, and the first comment comes in. Great job. Yes. <laughs> I hit refresh. Excellent video. I look forward to the next one. This was just the first uh, of a two-part video. I was going to work on the second one next. I hit refresh. Where is part two? Where? I need it now. <laughs> People other than my mom were saying nice things about me on the internet. It felt like I had finally arrived. I hit refresh. His voice is annoying. No offense. OK, no offense taken. Refresh. Could you remake this without peanut butter in your mouth? OK, at least the feedback is, is somewhat constructive, right? Uh, hit refresh. Please don't use this narrator again. You can barely understand him. Refresh. Couldn't follow because of the Indian accent. OK, 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 two things. Number one, I don't have an Indian accent. I have a Pakistani accent, OK? And number two, I clearly have a Pakistani accent. <laughs> but comments like that kept coming in. And so I figured I should just ignore them and start working on the second part of the video. I recorded my audio, but every time I sat down to edit, I just could not do it. OK, thank you. And I'm sorry if some of you couldn't uh, follow the sound or the, the image on that video. I hope you're able to pick it up on TED.com. So what I wanted to point out is that in uh, a course that I worked on, in, uh, it's called Perspectives. It's an upper secondary course that's about to be published. We use this video. And of course, the, the materials have a, a normal uh, pronunciation syllabus. But we also included this discussion question, uh, because I think it's important to get people to reflect on their own accent. It's a fairly simple line of questioning. How do you feel about your own accent in English? Would you like to change it? What would be a normal accent for you? And so we're opening up the idea that, that, uh, that we can talk about learners' accents in this way and that, that an accent is a positive thing, um, very often a positive thing. There, there are far more positives than negatives to accent. OK, so I'd like to just uh, sum up where we are with accent. Tips for accent. I would suggest that the first priority for speakers is to speak intelligibly. And if 
if the goal, if somebody wants to develop a native-like accent, I say, that's great, good luck, and I hope it works out. Some people do do that. But I think we should question whether a native-like accent really should be the standard. Surely the most important thing is for speakers to be able to be understood. The other side of accent is that even if you yourself have a native-like accent, because 75% of the interaction that takes place in English is between L2 users, you are going to hear Chinese people speaking English, you're going to hear German people speaking English, you're going to hear Peruvians speaking English, and all of those people will have their own L1 accent. So we need to help our learners develop the authentic listening skills that are necessary to decode a variety of accents. Uh, which is why it's great to listen to TED Talks and other uh, materials, even if somebody's speaking uh, with a little bit of poor grammar or whatever. It's authentic English, and we need to help our learners understand that. Okay, next is culture. We talked about real English, and I pointed out that all of those things that everyone suggested as real English are real English, American, British, um, New Zealand English, but also German English is real English, Chinese English is real English, the English that every one of you is speaking is real English. Then we talked about the question of accent and how uh, maybe the native speaker target isn't the most constructive target for our learners. I'd now like to talk about the third section, culture, which is what got um, our two, our British and American soldiers in such trouble in their communication during the Korean War. Here's another question for you, and this isn't a poll. I'd just like you to chat, uh, to put your answers in the chat box. What culture do you expect your learners to participate in as English speakers? Or what culture do your learners expect to participate in as English speakers? So it could be US culture, it could be UK culture. We've got Facebook culture there. U.S. academic, international, American, U.K. Okay, so what I want to be clear about, um, absolutely, if your learners have a connection to the U.S. or the U.K., they need to go to the U.S., they need to go to the U.K., learning about U.S. and U.K. culture is very important, and I'm not diminishing that. But we get. I have a lot of people typing that um, they want that, that their learners will interact with as many cultures as possible. Uh, and so I'd like to, in light of the fact that the research shows that 75% of the communication in English is between L2 users, I'd like to look a little bit more closely at the question of culture. I've got another war story here for you. This is probably highly familiar. This is the Trojan horse. In Greek mythology, the Greeks, the Greek army surrounded the city of Troy for 10 years. There was this war, and the Greeks couldn't win it, and the Trojans couldn't win it. The city of Troy was under siege. So finally, in, in kind of desperation, the Greeks came up with a plan. They made this huge wooden horse, and they left it outside the city of Troy, and then they got, the Greeks got in their boats, and they pretended to leave. And the Trojans went, yay, we've won, the Greeks have left, and they left behind this beautiful horse, and the Trojans took the horse and wheeled it inside their city as a trophy of war. And what happened next, as you know, was that the, some of the best Greek soldiers came out from the inside of the Trojan horse, and they killed the Trojan army, and the Greeks then came back on their boats and the Greeks won because of this thing, the, these soldiers hidden inside the Trojan horse. It's not an uncommon view to see the English language as a kind of Trojan horse. We could say that within the English language we have the American dream, whatever that is. Or in a darker way, we have the colonial legacy of the, the kind of enforced spread of English uh, ar around the world in the uh, in the Victorian period, say, 
or fast food, the, the country that invented fast food, American culture, or the, the culture for better or for worse of Hollywood, or punk rock, or Starbucks coffee, all of these things in one way could be seen as being part of the English language. And that is not an unreasonable view. I, I, I think that is, is a view that has a lot of traction. But I don't think it's the only view of English, and I don't think it's the, the full reality. Another, another way of looking at English is that it's a tool. It's a useful tool that's been chosen by people who want to get things done. It's the tool for the global citizen. It's the tool for culturally agile people. Imagine a German engineer and a Brazilian engineer and a Chinese engineer working together on an oil project in Saudi Arabia. They'll speak English together, of course, but when it comes to questions of politeness or questions of how you address someone above you or below you in a hierarchy, these are cultural questions. And they aren't necessarily part of, they're not necessarily built into the English language. So do these people aim for American politeness or British politeness or Australian politeness or Brazilian politeness, Chinese politeness? And the answer is these cultural questions or cultural lingual questions need to be negotiated together by the, the people who are using the English language together. What we have is a world where people in Northern Europe are communicating with Central China in English and people in farther Northern Europe are communicating with people in farther Northern China, people in Saudi Arabia communicating with, with Thailand people all over the world communicating in English to get work done or to study or to chat on Facebook to socialize and in many cases 75 percent of the time this communication is not going via the US or via the UK and doesn't involve the cultural reference of whatever the norms are in English L1 cultures we find that people in Saudi Arabia are learning about uh, people in Korea via the medium of English. They're not, they're not using English to learn about American culture. They're using English to learn about Korean culture. When I was uh, in, in my job in Japan, my, my Japanese students spoke English with their German suppliers, their German counterparts in factories in Germany. They spoke in English with those people. Nothing to do with American culture or British culture or any English L1 culture. Okay, with all of that in mind, with uh, the way we know English is used a lot of the time, I'd like to take another look at uh, a video, another TED Talk. This is a TED Talk by a guy called Hitain Patel and uh, uh, his co-presenter Yu Yu Rao. And the only thing I'll tell you about this is that when it starts off, uh, you're going to hear Hitain speaking Chinese. And that's part of the talk, which I'll explain a little later. So if you, if you hear Chinese and don't understand it or do understand it, it's, it's part of the talk. So Emily, if you could... Start the video, please. Woman, Kaya Togo Swasi put on the Uyen, Laurence put on the Pamfama. To the El Swasi Ko in, Hachandia Iwai, Hayo Sutu. Hi, I'm Hei Ten, I'm an artist. And this is Yu Yu, who is a dancer I've been working with. I have asked her to translate for me. If I may, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself and my artwork. I was born and raised near Manchester in England, but I'm not going to say it in English to you as I'm trying to avoid any assumptions that might be made from my northern accent. 
除了要学习口音和腔调以外，还有是去更重要的是手势、特有的习惯和动作。The only problem with masking it with Chinese Mandarin is I can only speak this paragraph, which I have learned by heart when I was visiting in China. So all I can do is keep repeating it in different tones and hope you won't notice. Okay. So after that introduction, uh, Hitain goes on to talk about the cultures that have influenced his life. His parents were from India, uh, immigrated to the UK via Mombasa in Kenya. He grew up in the UK. Uh, he loved aspects of both cultures uh, and as a result developed a certain amount of what I call cultural agility. He also talks uh, in the talk about people he admired and imitated. His father uh, is one example, the famous uh, kung fu actor Bruce Lee, the superhero Spider-Man. And then uh, as he discusses, he also spent some uh, time working in China, learned a bit of Chinese, which he goes on to talk more about. So the talk is really all about seeing different ways of doing things and Um, sorry about that, that was a slip. So after talking about I imitation and kind of developing his own identity, uh, I'll now play the way the talk finishes up. So Emily, if you could run the, the part two of the Patel talk. There it comes. Thank you. It's now etched into my mind, clearer than the PIN number to my bank card. So I can pretend I speak Chinese fluently. When I had learned this phrase, I had an artist over there hear me out to see how accurate it sounded. I spoke the phrase and then he laughed and told me Oh yeah, that's great. Only kind of sounds like woman. I say, what? He said, yeah, you learn from woman? I say, yes, so? He then explained the tonal differences between male and female voices are very different and distinct. And then I had learned it very well, but in woman's voice. Okay, um, so this imitation business does come with risk. It doesn't always go as you plan it, even with a talented uh, translator. Um, but I am going to stick with it because contrary to what we might usually uh, assume, imitating somebody can reveal something unique. So every time I fail to become more like my father, I become more like myself. Every time I fail to become Bruce Lee, I become more authentically me. This is my art. I'm, I strive for authenticity. Even if it comes in a shape that we might not usually expect. It's only recently that I've started to understand that I didn't learn to sit like this through being Indian. I learned this from Spider-Man. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So it's kind of self-explanatory. It's all about seeing the, uh, the richness of, of culture as possibility. And uh, rather than the, the way that he learned to speak Chinese in a woman's voice, rather than seeing that as a huge mistake, he sees it as an opportunity. He sees it as another uh, interesting part of his complex personality. I recommend that you look at the whole video. And in fact, Hitain Patel and I are going to work together on a, a webinar 
on, I think, the 25th of October. So if you want to see him speak in a webinar with me, uh, watch this space, and uh, we'll be doing that at the end of October. Uh, in the keynote, which I wrote, we used this, among other things, to get learners to uh, reflect. Again, I, I keeps coming back to accent, but th in this case, accent as it's related to culture. So we asked learners to um, reflect on what people can tell about them in their own culture based on their L1 accent. And then we also look at these questions of identity. What's the most important for you? Uh, and these are all cultural questions, your language, your nationality, or your ethnicity. And so that's a way to kind of springboard from that, uh, that TED Talk into the classroom. So summing up my thoughts on culture today, what we want to encourage our learners to do is develop cultural agility. It's, it, it, if, if, they, if they need to go to the U.S., then by all means, they need to learn about U.S. culture. But if they're going to be working with all kinds of different cultures, making them aware of the fact that they will need to negotiate certain cultural matters in, in these mixed culture situations, you'll be doing them a favor. And yourself, bear in mind, you know, what, what culture is actually contained in English and what culture do your learners really need to learn about? The other thing about culture, the other tip is that culture, as I said, is often, we could say, created as necessary. The, the, the engineers I mentioned all working together in Saudi Arabia, they're not referring to U.S. or U.K. culture. They're referring to a culture that arises almost conversation by conversation and certainly group by group on a, uh, as, as the need arises. Okay, I have one more section in the talk. Um, and this is audience. We talked uh, initially about real English and real English including an awful lot of L2, L2 communication. Uh, we talked about accent and the target being intelligibility, maybe more than, than speaking like a native. We've just spoken about culture and uh, questioned what amount of culture is actually contained in English and suggested that possibly the most interesting thing that's happening culturally when English is spoken is this mix of people from all over bringing all their cultures to, uh, to the conversation. I'd like to jump straight into a video by a guy called Diebedo Francis Carey. He's from Burkina Faso. And in his TED Talk, he, as we'll see, uh, first of all, introduces some information about his own upbringing and then goes on to talk about how he went from Africa to study engineering, uh, sorry, study architecture at university in Germany, and then comes back to his home village and builds a school and a community center uh, and a library. The video, the TED Talk is about 12 minutes, I think. It's visually very beautiful. If you love architecture, you love buildings, it's worth seeing just for that. But it's also a very uplifting TED Talk. So I, I recommend that you check it out. Um, let's roll the video, please, Emily. Thank you. I was born in a little village called Gandu. In Gandu, there was no electricity no access to clean drinking water and no school but my father wanted me to learn how to read and write for this reason i have to leave my family when i was seven and to stay in a city far away from my village with no contact to my family in this place i sat in a class like that with more than 150 other kids and for six years okay so in the in the same way that people need to learn to be culturally agile I think our learners need to develop a certain amount of linguistic agility as speakers in a public uh, situation like giving a presentation or a TED talk or just in conversation learners need to learn to do everything they can to help get their message across they need to use all available resources uh, to make sure that they're clearly understood 
And as audience members, as people who are listening, we need to help our learners develop the skill of adapting to, as I mentioned earlier, listening to different accents. Or in the case of this talk, we could say listening to a bit of ungrammatical English. He said, uh, just in that clip, he said he had no contact to his family. And of course, everyone knows the preposition there should be with. It's a little mistake. It's not a big deal. We can adapt to listening to that as uh, as a uh, you know because we want to to hear uh, his big idea. One thing uh, again, looking at accent, he has a a strong and noticeable accent, but in many ways, it it makes him easier to understand. Uh, uh, in fact, the way we exploit this video in keynote where we use it uh, is is looking at the idea of different stress patterns you may know that uh, there are two basic divisions of languages in the world stress stress timed languages and syllable timed languages English is stress timed but more than half the world's languages are syllable timed and carries l1 is syllable timed which means that there's a certain rhythm to the way the language is timed and he brings that into his English and the result of that is a he doesn't sound like a native speaker but b in fact he's easier to understand because of that easier than some native speakers are to understand uh so that's looking at the 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 uh listening side of of the question of audience the other side of audience is uh how we accommodate audience or how we how we present ourselves uh, again this is giving a presentation or in conversation uh, and in the keynote uh, in keynote advanced we we talk about being authentic that um, the way we present ourselves in English is in some ways like Hattain was talking about these bits and pieces taken from from everywhere we develop uh, a voice in a second language and we want to help our learners develop their own authentic voice in English and one way we can do that is by showing them plenty of examples of L2 users non-native speakers who have something to say and who have developed their own voice in English that's why uh, one reason why TED talks are great Okay, we are getting very near the end now. Just summing up my thoughts on audience. With teaching our learners, it's it's of course they need to um, they need to learn grammar, they need to learn vocabulary, but they also need to learn awareness of audience and accommodating their speech to uh, the people who are listening to. In fact, I've heard it said that some native English speakers should have lessons in global English uh, because in a, the research shows that often if you have a group of um, three or four people speaking together and one of those people is a native speaker, an L1 user, the other people are L2 users of English, the person who is the most difficult to understand is very often the native speaker and all the non-native speakers will understand one another perfectly well uh, and that's because they've developed the skills of accommodation and adaptation that L1 users haven't developed. The other side of audience is listening and that's learning to adapt to uh, speakers speech and this goes back to the idea of learning to listen to all kinds of different accents but it's also rolling with a bit of ungrammatical English uh, and kind of actively uh, engaging with a variety of different types of speech. Okay, which brings us to wrapping it up. I said at the beginning that real English is only 16% spoken by L1 users and 84% spoken by L2 users. So of course, real English includes British English, American English, formal English, informal English, English for academic purposes, etc. But it also includes an awful lot of, of L2 English, the type that we've heard uh, in a lot of these TED Talks. A reasonable goal for accent may be intelligibility rather than uh, 
speaking just like a native and we need to help our learners get used to listening to a variety of English accents. Again, that's one reason why TED Talks are great because a lot of TED Talks are given by L2 users of English. When it comes to culture, if your learners are going to the US or if they're going to the UK or they're going to work with American engineers or they're going to work with British teachers, then the cultural target is clear. It's the US or the UK. But so much more often these days we've got Mexican engineers uh, in, in Mexico working in the Volkswagen plant with German engineers speaking English together. So the cultural, uh, the cultural target is not clear and probably not contained within the English language and it's something that needs to be negotiated. And as we just spoke about, spoke about looking at uh, Diabeto Francis Carey's talk, the question of audience, we need to make our learners aware as speakers of the necess necessity of accommodating the people who are listening to them and as audience members of adapting to a variety of different types of speech that they may hear. I've got one final poll just to uh, see what you make of the talk that I've given. Uh, Emily, if you could drag the poll, this is one where there are actually buttons that you can choose. So the question is, which of the, th the these three main ideas that I've talked about uh, is probably the most important? If you had to choose one to take to your desert island teaching situation, would it be the idea of intelligent, uh, intelligible accent, cultural agility, or accommodation and adaptation? Okay, it looks like we're getting a strong lead with accommodation and adaptation there at the end. So that's good. Again, if, if you were not able to see the videos, all of the TED Talks are available at TED.com and they're all worth checking out. They're some of my favorites that I've shared with you. Also, uh, Emily is going to tell you a bit more about the uh, Project Pack, which is some downloadable uh, lessons that are built around another TED Talk that we haven't looked at. Uh, but it's one from the keynote series, so that's available. Uh, she's also going to talk a little bit more, so stick around uh, about certificates and so on. But at this point, if anyone has any questions or comments you'd like to type into the chat box, uh, I can uh, try to address uh, a few of them. It's not always easy to address everyone, but I'll try to keep up if anyone wants to jump in with anything you'd like to, to share or ask. Okay, well, I'm getting lots of thanks there. I appreciate the kind words, and thank you all very much for taking the time to show up and for, um, hang on. How can we motivate students to listen to and adapt to different varieties of English? You know, TED Talks are great for that. One thing that I've, I firmly believe in as a teacher and a materials developer is if you give, if you choose interesting content for learners to listen to, then and ignore the fact that they're listening to different varieties of English. Just choose interesting content. They'll want to know what it's all about. So try to find things that learners are actually doing anyway. Social media is another, although social media tends to be typed, um, but choosing different content, uh, different uh, interesting content and TED Talks are a wonderful resource for that. What do I think of the European Council framework? Um, 
<laughs> Not entirely related to this. I think it's a tool that can be of use, but uh, I don't think it is a complete definition of English or necessarily always helpful for leveling, but it's certainly not a bad place to start. We use it for leveling materials, but I think people can get too, uh, too hung up on it. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to pick up one more question here, and I'm not going to be able to do it. Uh, but thank you for the questions. I'm sorry if I couldn't answer. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, just Google my name. It'll get you to my website. You can contact me through that. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect with teachers. And I think I'm going to now pass it back over to Emily, who has a few final things um, to to close with. So again, thank you very much for the kind words, for the participation. It was interesting to watch the chat. Not completely easy for me as I'm trying to talk, but I could see that a lot of you were very engaged uh, and I appreciate it a lot. So thank you very much. Over to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Lewis, and thank you everyone for attending today. As Lewis mentioned, um, we are, as a thank you for attending this webinar, giving out a project pack from Keynote to use in your class. It will include downloadable video from the TED Talk Sleepy Man Banjo Boys, and then also the student book pages to print out and use in class, as well as the teacher guide pages. So stay tuned for that. That will actually be emailed to you, along with the certificate of attendance in the next few days. Um, just a few other points. Well, thank you again. Uh, many of the examples that we looked at today are from National Geographic Learning's keynotes for adult learners and perspectives for teenage learners. Lewis is one of the authors for these programs, and he's an expert in working with TED Talks in the secondary and adult classrooms. If you enjoyed today's session, please visit ngl.cengage.com backslash webinars to learn about upcoming NGL webinars for adults, teens, and young learners. And be sure to subscribe to our InFocus blog at ngl.cengage.com slash InFocus for more practical teaching tips for the ELT classroom. Lewis is actually writing a series for us right now, and his first post in that series will come out this week, so stay tuned for that and be sure to subscribe. And as I mentioned, just look out for that email in the next few days with the certificate of attendance, the project pack, and a recording of this session. So thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your evening, morning, or afternoon.